Good morning, everyone. I'm Carlotta Contreras Cotterbay. I'm the director for ETSU Tipton and Slocum Galleries here at the Department of Art and Design. And I am also the director or the co director for the Crafting Blackness Initiative. Um, so I will be talking about or focusing about the women craft artists of Tennessee. We have a very um, exciting and, and uh, unprecedented project in this uh, Crafting Blackness initiative. And I will uh, request Dr. Hale to um, share the screen for the PowerPoint presentation so you all can see some images. And we will open the um, question and answer at the end of the uh, presentation. Hmm. So the Crafting Blackness initiative yes. started with the Tennessee craft. Next slide, please. Um, with the Tennessee craft um, initiating a program of doing this nationwide search for a researcher to document the 100 years history of Black Tennessee uh, African American craft artists. And I was fortunate enough to be selected uh, by, by their committee. And it's supposed to be a one-year program, but it developed into a five-year program because it's such a very complex and, and so much information and, and so much opportunities for visibility for the African-American artists in the show. Next slide, please. So we, this project, just a really quick uh, background, the 100 years history of African-American craft artists in Tennessee from 1920 up to the present will include a database of hundreds of Black Tennessee artists, not just craft-based, but African-American artists based in Tennessee, a collection of bibliography, uh, bibliography artist statements, uh, video, and uh, a traveling exhibition starting this 2023 here at ETSU until 2027 to culminate in a major show, uh, a blockbuster exhibition at the Memphis Brooks uh, Museum of Art. But in the next four years, we will be traveling this exhibition uh, throughout the state, focusing on African-American craft artists. And with the exhibitions, our public uh, engagements like panels, artist talk, workshops, um, and also uh, full color catalog and coloring books that we will, uh, and, and all of these are open and free to the public. Next slide, please. The Crafting Blackness Initiative has become a very inclusive, very collaborative project. So just to kind of give you a rundown, the first two shows will uh, are here at ETSU. One has already been finished at Tipton Gallery that we opened last September 1st during First Friday. And the second one um, is ongoing here at Slocum Galleries in Ball Hall. The exhibition is co-curated with the fabulous uh, Karen LeBlanc-Sullivan. She is a director of advancement here at ETSU, but also an artist, a face painter, body painter, who is also a art and cultural advocate. She is one of the board members of UMOJA, the African-American um, Unity uh, Festival here in Johnson City. And so the next set of exhibition will be in March, 2024 in Hiram Van Gordon Gallery in Tennessee State University, as well as in Todd Gallery in Middle uh, Tennessee State University. And you can see in the fall, we have two exhibitions as well. Uh, in Martin Public Library and the Lincoln Museum. And then in 2025, 2026, and 2027, we're going to be going to different parts of the country, uh, of the state. After 2027, we will be going out of the state to uh, bring these exhibitions elsewhere. Next slide, please. So these are just uh, some of my partners. Um, on the left is Bonnie Matthews. She was the Community Engagement Program Director at Tennessee Craft and now the co-director for the Crafting Blackness Initiative. Uh, I'm the second uh, person there with a black rim eyeglasses. And obviously, the, the third person is Kim Wag. She's the executive, executive director of Tennessee Craft. And the, the last one, uh, on the right is Karen Sullivan, our co-curator. We are. This was taken during the uh, panel and reception last week at Slocum Galleries with the exhibition uh, on the background. Next slide, please. So historically, African-American communities, not just in Tennessee, um, 
actually go back please <laughs> thank you uh are always not included in the master narrative and this project is um an effort to address that the the visibility invisibility the omissions in the master narrative of BIPOC and and especially the black communities in the art um so now that we are doing this project we are employing craft in order to provide visibility and more understanding and and really to kind of provide some of these missing narratives in, in, in history and art history. And so we are using craft in a way as a platform um, to kind of really explore Black life. And we are investigating and, and recognizing the craft practitioners who use their practice of craft as agency to reconcile the trauma of history, scars of colorism, oppression, illness, and poverty, and different issues uh, that are relevant to the communities today. Next slide, please. In order to understand the history and role of craft making in Tennessee, I was hired to do a survey uh, essay. But as I research, there was just so much uh, challenge in finding black craft artists from Tennessee. First, because museums don't label their artists based on geography and ethnicity. And also a lot of our African-American craft practitioners are in the category of unnamed or artist once known. And so we really tried so much to really provide these names and search for these names because they are named, they are there, they are present. And we are doing that recognition now. Um, in the project, we also had some definitions of craft uh, because people are like, how do you define craft? How do you define and, and select artists to be in the show? So we have uh, on the screen, you will be able to read some of these definitions. But for us, craft is strongly associated with the handmade. It's very important that the art practice is using the body and 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 the technology that uses their own hands or their own body in creating work but we also don't want to be so limited by that by just material and 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 skill we also wanted to really kind of recognize that the craft is more complex and nuanced and it's not just about materials or form but it is also about the narratives it's also about the symbolism it's also about the dreams that these and and the narratives that these objects are sharing next slide please for the purpose of um next slide please for the purpose of if, um efficiency and and relevance we are going to focus on the Black women craft artists from the exhibitions Black Bodies Making Form. These are these are the two exhibitions that is um, that is in the Slocum Galleries and uh, was at Tipton Gallery a few weeks ago. So this is one of the my favorite wall because on even if the title of the show is officially Black Bodies Making Form. We actually added the master's Black Tennessee craft on this wall, on this gallery, because we wanted to kind of play a little bit on the concept of the masters. Because a lot of these artists came from formerly enslaved four parents, four fathers, four mothers, or, or ancestors. And the concept of being free and a master of their own faith is important in this research and an exhibition series so we're using the term master not just to recognize their skill as artists or crafts masters or masters or experts on specific creative skill but also master of their own faith another element of the masters uh is that masters are normally don't apply to women and for me there are women masters 
artist. And so we really wanted to reiterate that and visualize that. And by uh, kind of reclaiming that term masters for our women craft artists, I think it's important and relevant um, in the conversation of today. Next slide, please. These are just some of the uh, shots that uh, the the exhibition on the four foreground is William Edmondson. He's not part of the talk, but I just wanted to mention he is the first African American artist to be featured in a solo exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in 1937, and that's how important this exhibition. William Edmondson and all of the other almost 50 artists in the show have never been exhibited together in a show like this. This is the first, and it's a first of a series. So we're very proud of this project. Next slide, please. We will be talking about some of the artists. Uh, on the right is Andra McCoy, uh, the one with the black uh, drapery background, and then on, uh, in front of it are Hattie Marshall Duncan's work. And then in the acrylic box is the sculpture of Bessie Harvey. Uh, the gourd uh, sculptures are by Audra McCoy. Uh, Audra, uh, I'm sorry, Jane Bias. We will be talking a little bit more about them. So next slide, please. This is just one of the uh, walls as well that has some of the female uh, and male artists in the exhibition. Next slide, please. This is a wall of uh, historical male artist who is famous for their repose, but on the uh, pedestal there, the, one of the figures is actually made by a female, uh, a woman craft artist, Tina Curry. So I really wanted to kind of just show the 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 level of expertise uh, that that both men and women um, of Tennessee Black community creates. On the left is a baseball field with human figures carved from peach pits. Next slide, please, by Roger Smith. So these are the, the women artists of uh, the, or the influential um, master craft artists. In addition to them, there will be several contemporary artists that I will be discussing. Next slide, please. So we, Karen and I, when we were uh, curating the show, we wanted to really um, focus on how is this exhibition going to be relevant to the Black community. And for her, she really considers Black craft pr practitioners as visual griots. Uh, griots are very uh, kind of historically significant in the African uh, community, and it has migrated to African-American uh, community where these are storytellers. And, and um, some can be in the form of music like bards, you know, but for us, the, the craft practitioners are visual griots, visualizing narratives of their communities. And some of the historical artists are Bessie Harvey and Georgia Speller. They, the two of them are some of the most famous Black um, artists in the country, not just in the state. They have been recently exhibited at the Royal Academy of London last March through the Souls Grundy Foundation and various um, museums through the years. There's also um, a good collection of Black uh, and uh, craft artists, not just women, but even men, uh, Black craft artists in the Tennessee State Museum. But there is not a comprehensive listing and that's why we're doing this project. Um, a lot of the artists that you will uh, encounter in the, in the exhibition are self-taught uh, for the more senior generation. Most of them come from um, communities or, or families with craft uh, practice in their family because of need, because of economic uh, reasons. And, and then it has become a family tradition that has been passed over, not just from mother to daughters, but sometimes from fathers to daughters, fathers to son, uh, grandparents to grandchildren. Next slide, please. A lot of the artists um, after this uh, senior artist, next slide, please, um, are now um, you know, from, from the self-taught folk artist, the post-civil rights generation are now in the academia. They have finished their BFA or MFA, and some of them 
were academically trained on a different field or a different art form, and then they migrated to the visual arts afterwards. So these are some of the people that we will be encountering later on. So this is probably our last uh, slide that you will have text. The next few slides will just be images that you will see, and we will be discussing uh, individual artists after that. So before I go to the individual artists, I wanted to emphasize that we investigate craft as visualized memories. These are craft, of course, is about function, craft object as um, functional objects or uh, utilitarian objects, but they are also uh, vessels of memory and they represent or visualize vignettes of black life and also black bodies. So we gaze at craft through blackness or the black gaze and we are amazed and enamored by the black figures that this men and women have presented or created because these are the empowered images of how they want to be seen or how they see themselves and and I hope this will be as inspiring to you all as it has been for us next slide please so the this is the other gallery where the contemporary artists are uh, located and, 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 and displayed. And I hope you all get a chance to, to see this exhibition uh, once we uh, are done with the lecture because it's only open until Saturday. So I hope you get to see it. Next slide, please. So these are some of the, the groupings. Next slide, please. The subsection uh, that we just saw uh, has something about, like, we talk about Black life and we talk about Black care, about Black beauty, and about the precariousness of um, the Black life. And this is something that is kind of expressed, that political aspect. So even if this is a craft show, we're still kind of pushing some of these issues and, and, and the boundaries and conversations of what is relevant to the Black community. So here we are looking at not just adornments or or but the the body as really the body who demands a seat at the table the body who rejects the violence and the trauma in history and the 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 black body who demands repatriation or or um healing from all these historical scars next slide please this is actually a special wall because this is featuring Black Appalachian Highland artists. These are all Johnson City or Metro Johnson City artists that we have exhibited through the years and through the Juneteenth exhibition at Fishman Gallery. Next slide, please. This is Samuel Dunson, 24-hour uh, news uh, network, or he is, he's not going to be part of the talk, but it's still kind of alluding to 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 that historical trauma next slide please okay next slide please now we are going to um see this is tipton gallery and this is one of the subgroupings of the hair see uh on the left side is jernisha's um ceramic piece and then samuel dunson and then andra mccoy's and kimberly dunson's uh, body forms and the jellyfish by Nigel Woods. So I just wanted to kind of let you see the exhibitions and then we'll go to the individual artists. Next slide, please. This is what Tipton Gallery looked like. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The three uh, quilts on the back we will discuss later that is from three generations of the story family, the grandmother, the mother, and the son who makes quilts and the small image is the daughters. So next slide, please. Now that you have seen the exhibition pictures of the two venues, we will go to the individual artists. And the first one, next slide, please, is Ludi Amos. Ludi is a self-taught artist. She's a quilter and a multimedia uh, doll maker. She is from Clarksville, Tennessee, and she is one of the master craft artists that has been uh, 
recognized by the Tennessee Arts Commission. When she began 40 years ago, she decided that she needed art to fill her walls. Her mother taught her how to uh, sew and quilt, uh, but her stories are about growing up in rural South. So this is something that is very common to the more senior artists. It's 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 a, a kind of like a documentation and and the need to narrate their uh, stories, their history, their family, um, and and the sh the work that we have in the show is actually one of the rare uh, works by by Ludi that is usually either in quilt form or. Uh, female figures, but this is a collaboration between her and another Black photographer, Carlton Wilkinson, who photographed the Million Man March in D.C., and she made the, the dolls. Next slide, please. She curated this, uh, this, this uh, installation, and you can see a Black man holding a Confederate flag that really speaks of the complexity of history and the reality of the South and and and, and also uh, the the dialectics you know in, in, in the African American community. So most of her work will show farm scenes or families on their porches reading or she will do uh, kind of like the more uh, pastoral uh, scene but this, is one of her kind of more obvious political work. And we really wanted it in the show to be like the first thing that you will see when you go to the gallery um, because it really puts art and craft in, in, in the contemporary where art and the tr traditions, when you think of craft, you think of tradition, that this is not a issue of authenticity or or culture as as um frozen in time but culture as evolving culture as complex next slide please so the next artist um is jane bias she is from morristown ludi amos who was an art teacher similar to jane bias they were coming from different fields before they practiced art in their later years so jane on her second marriage uh married to the bias family her her husband ralph is a very creative family and so she learned how to use her hands and use um carving tools when she married to the bias family and she kind of calls her art Afro-Latin art because of her Native American, African American, and Caucasian heritage. Um, when she started, it was actually her sister-in-law who kind of coined the term Afro-Latin for her. And she said that she, growing up in rural uh, Jefferson uh, County in Tennessee, she got a degree in horticulture. And she raised children and worked in local factories, but it was through the art that uh, 15 years ago that she was um, inspired by the gourd carvings that she saw on a yard sale. And from then on, she kind of started making her own. And she is inspired by the African-American tradition and the color palette and the accessories um, and the shells, the, the shells that was used as a monetary um, or a currency in, in Af some African-American communities or African communities, I mean. Um, so uh, from a self-thought, she has been exhibited in like Oak Ridge Museum um, and, and, and different places. Um, next slide, please. So these are some of her um, images that are clearly inspired by the African uh, culture, but it's also showing like on the forehead or it's kind of like reminiscent of the landscape, you know, of of of, of the state. So this is a amalgamation of her culture of being uh, a local Tennessean and at the same time, somebody whose roots is connected to a land far away. And that is important. Next slide, please. Tina Curry, she is a master craft artist whose 
uh, mentor is also a, mas a Black mastercraft artist, Bill Capshaw. Her work, um, she only started 27 years ago uh, in playmaking. She was actually from graphic design. She is based in Knoxville and she makes figurative um, ceramic and metal works. Next slide, please. She, her, um, this work that is in uh, the Slocum Galleries is one of those exquisite example of her figurative work. When she started, she started making ceramic masks to emulate her mentor, uh, Bill Capshaw's uh, practice. But she said she didn't understand uh, the anatomy. And so she started researching and really learning about the human figure. And now this is the kind of work that she does, or at least one of the examples. She also do more stylistic animals and aside from the human figure, but it really just shows how the technical uh, ability of, of some of these women um, practitioners uh, really represent. Next slide, please. Tina also, um, as a former student who is now an equally um, uh, amazing mentor or master craft artist, is uh, in the board of Aromont and teaches there. Um, as well as part of the Southern Highlands Guild in the region. She has also been um, featured at Ceramics Magazines. And her work started from commissioned works from the zoo. So her, her work started from animal figures. Um, but she really uh, goes back to the human figures every now and then, that pool of, of representation. And it, there's always a part of herself in, 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 in all these works. Next slide, please. Now, Kimberly DeMonts is a professor at the Middle Tennessee State University. She is a printmaker and a sculptor. Her work focuses on the human body and her work are really exciting because she um, makes casting and, and of bronze and, and, and stainless and, and different materials that are often associated with the male practice or male sculptors. And she is now teaching other students uh, how to um, handle these uh, materials. And so she is focusing on the, the female figure as a Black woman and using music as an inspiration and 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 her works are very lyrical next slide please and some of the works that she does you know this is called the reflected identity and in the african uh american community there is the concept of double consciousness of 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 being of two selves being african and being american and you know and then that this work really kind of visualizes that dichotomy and and at the same time the the challenges and and also some of the distinct qualities of of that uh double consciousness that has been espoused by black uh scholar uh Dubois. Now with um Kimberly, she is also a member of the board of the Mid-South Sculpture Alliance and she has been featured at the sculpture magazine and art papers and exhibited in different parts of, of the country. Next slide, please. Cynthia Gadsden is actually an art historian who during the, uh, she's the art historian at Tennessee State University, but in during COVID, uh, the pandemic, she started making art or craft. And next slide, please. She was one of the panelists um, last week and this is one of the works that was in the show. So she weaves baskets from, from treads because that is the available uh, material for her. And um, last spring, she also curated a show about the hair in TSU. And it's, it's, it's very exciting how she is kind of looking back at the traditional, excuse me, um, weaving process as a black woman and and at the same time exploring some of these relevant issues about beauty 
Um, her research explores the interconnecting threads of African American art, history, and culture, and how cultural knowledge is transferred and transformed from one generation to the other. So um, this is, I think, her kind of world premiere, because this is the first time that she has exhibited her her craft object, not as an art historian, but as an artist herself. Next slide, please. Bessie Harvey may be the most important Black women Tennessee artist because uh, earlier in, in, in her career, she has been exhibited in New York and various institutions. Um, she is one of those artists that are called folk artists or self-taught. Um, the Souls Grown Deep Foundation now renamed that and rebrands that um, grouping of artists into a Black South vernacular artists. So um, Bessie Harvey is one of those um, highly documented and highly visible um, women, Black women artists from Tennessee. This work on the right is um, from the collection of the Knoxville Museum of Art. Knoxville KMA has one of the biggest collection of the Delaney brothers, two of the most um, historical and influential and, and renowned East Tennessee uh, Black artist and Bessie Harvey is also, uh, they have uh, several of her collection. Next slide, please. The bird that you will see in the show is actually, this is the first time that this has been um, shown in public because most of Bessie Harvey's work is about the human figure. And Bessie Harvey uses roots or tree branches and found objects to embody her personal spirituality and speak about life's challenges. Um, she was a victim of domestic abuse um, and so her art became her salvation and she really uses her art as her way of spiritual practice. She believes these works are her little people are imbued by the spirits of her ancestors and her kins and her art uh, came out of the struggle and became her tool for surviving life, not just economic, but social and 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 uh, marital um, issues as well. So she creates her dolls morph into complex sculptures by using paint and other accessories to adorn them. And these organic forms are then awakened uh, dormant characters from within. So she uses her her craft practice to bring out the spirit from within of this this materials. Next slide, please. Now, from the senior generation to the more younger. So Elise Kendrick is uh, one of the younger artists in the show. She was featured at the Frist Art Museum recently and one of the featured artists that Dr. Cynthia Gadsden uh, featured on her uh, exhibition about women African-American hair. So Elise is one of those academically trained artists and coming from a long line of storytellers and educators, her desire to visually tell her stories are um, created forms through printmaking and painting and other mixed media. She, you will notice the the different combs and 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 hair uh, styling objects on the background of this kind of this is a stretch canvas with a t-shirt coming out of the uh, of the square or the rectangular uh, limit. So it it is a very dynamic image, and you can see the text "Beautiful Human," and this is a very common. And, and 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 very um i think important issue in the black community of redefining beauty redefining the standards of beauty because centuries and and and, and decades of oppression and and uh white dominant uh standards of beauty have made the black community feel discriminated and oppressed and, and little and ugly and that is not right because they are beautiful they have their own um 
characteristics and 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 uh, beautiful hair and beautiful color and different features that needs to be recognized. Next um, slide, please. So she uses black figures in her experience as, as an African-American woman as inspiration for her own work. And she also uses the, the black hair, the different hair styling in, in, in her work in order to share the beauty of blackness and as well as to spark conversation uh, through her work. She creates visual voices for the people in her community, giving them the permission to unapologetically take up space. Um, and, and, and so that is a very, uh, I think, important um, element in her work. She uses um, women of color in her line of cut prints, and the subjects again, are about hair, race, culture, and disrupting societal norms. Often she uses bright colors or black and white, but sometimes um, she just really just want to visually communicate information about her subjects through simple gestures like this, um, combined with patterns and mixed media. Again, the shell is uh, showing up here and the black uh, toned uh, skin and, and the natural hair are, are, are very prominent in her work. Next slide, please. Now, Hattie Marshall Duncan, another one of the most famous master craft artists in the exhibition is from Jackson, Tennessee. She is one of the only two African-American artists in Tennessee that has received the Governor Arts Award, the highest um, recognition in the state for the arts. So she is also a self-taught sculptor. Hattie grew up with polio. And so when she was a young girl, she was not able to attend school regularly. And she was left in the house. And her father gave her or brought her um, art materials, not really, you know, sophisticated ones, but just pencil and paper and he was a, a, a folk artist himself and she was inspired she was very lonely growing up and it was the arts that kept her company she um in the 1990s she moved into the sculpture from the two-dimensional form and she created her own paper clay uh formula next slide please so her work are mostly about the family and the community and the different people she knows. So the one on the left is Pamela and the one on the blue blouse and white skirt is also Pamela. These two images are uh, visualizations of her sister, Pamela. And so she creates these forms and, and, and she's a very religious woman who trusts her intuition to guide her in her art. Much of her art depicts family and community members who are a vital part of her social network. Growing up, you know, sibling uh, politics and, and um, her mother being um, unable to really address her daughter's physical disabilities was a very big challenge for her. So her art is about forgiveness and, and art as a spiritual practice to survive the harshness of life and to create beauty despite of the physical illness and the poverty. At some point, she was homeless. Um, but now she is one of the master craft artists recognized by the Tennessee Arts Commission who is passing down uh, her skill through the apprenticeship program, first with his, her daughter and her grandson and now to other parts of uh, people in the community. She, um, her work is often paradoxical, uh, uh, being a spiritual uh, person herself, but at the same time, it is also very much reflected and uh, reflective of the local African-American community and the life, family life in, in Jackson, Tennessee. Her works are whimsical and amusing. Her uh, figures, have a deep spiritual dimension they are very you know um empowered and 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 the they represent a certain um kind of pride being an african american uh figure she uses common household items discarded materials 
um, right now she uses Amazon boxes for her paper clay. And she is she describes her her uh, practice as humble because it is composed of those common household materials, but also ambitious because her creative drive is dedicated, tireless, and productive, and also very innovative. Um, she has been ex exhibited at like Customs House uh, Museum in Clarksville, the West Tennessee Regional uh, Arts Center in Humboldt, and the West Tennessee Delta Heritage Center in Brownville, as well as in Lata and Selmer. She is an amazing um, crafts person and also a very articulate lady when you talk to her. Next slide, please. The next um, two artists are younger um, generation who grew up in Liberia, who migrated with their family to Knoxville. The necklace that I'm wearing today is made by Woki Masakwai dash wicks and her sister Tuberta Jackson made the brown um dress so these two sisters are nieces of the more prominent black Tennessee artist Fritz Masakwai Fritz was a painter primarily but he also delved into his African um ancestry by doing fiber work and that inspired the sisters to really go back to their um cultural uh ancestry and they their brother will send them beads from Africa and they will bead them themselves they will actually bead these uh materials using the traditional African uh uh technique but also make clothes inspired by the African American um fabric or using African uh inspired fabric but also some silhouettes that are very American and contemporary. So again, you will see the, the hybridity of culture here. They um, draw artistic inspiration from their homeland and its colorful tradition, and they uh, they create all these wearable fashion um, materials and, and objects. Next slide, please. We go again to another master craft artist, Andre McCoy from Memphis. She is one of those uh, self-thought uh, who grew up in a family of seamstress and quilters and her mixed media quilts reflect this lineage. She, her mother taught all the children how to sew and how to quilt and her great great aunt and grandmothers all quilted in the home where she grew up. So craft making is a family uh, endeavor for, for Andre and for most of these uh, craft artists. So she um, was raised in the historic African-American community of Orange Mount, a very significant um, historical uh, community because it's one of the first privately owned communities organized by the African-Americans who were formerly enslaved and purchased land uh, to create and build a community of their own. So this is a very important um, community, Orange Mound. So at the very end of this presentation, we'll have something about uh, Orange Mound as well. So Andra seeks to carry this distinct legacy of quilting in her family and from the utilitarian um, and, and uh, celebrate like visual celebration of marriage or death in the family. Now the quilts have become a reflection, as she said, of the diversity of innovative techniques, medium and improvisational thought of the African-American communities. So uh, Andra said her spiritual and moral obligation to pass down what she has mastered in the textile arts is African-American Quilt making is an Afri is an American art and is as rich and diverse as we are as a people. By her efforts in sharing her knowledge in this field, she is passing on the old songs of memories, promises, blues, and faith. So Andra will be coming to ETSU tomorrow. So I all encourage you to go to her uh, workshop at two o'clock on Friday at the Rees Museum and the panel and reception for the Sammy Nicely uh, collection, African-American art collection on Saturday at 4 to 6 p.m. So you can meet uh, in person Andre McCoy. This piece is a curtain that she made specifically for Sammy Nicely, who was a friend of hers. Next slide, please. 
And when he passed away, the family gave it back to Andre. And these two pieces are very special because this is a collaborative work between Andre and Sammy Nicely, who's famous for his ceramic masks. Next slide, please. Now, we will going to go really quick with the next artist because I know we only have uh, a few minutes left. Elisheba Morozik is a tattoo artist, also an academically trained uh, Black artist who has made this hood cloths. This is actually inspired by the African mud cloths, but she collects the soil from her neighborhood in Nashville, so she calls it hood cloths. And so for her, it's um, the, the hood cloths are important because of the connection with the African um, lineage and also each piece is an assertion, a reminder that the power to define Blackness lies within us or the Black community. It urges the Black community to look beyond the facades to question the origins of the symbols that we embrace and to craft our identity from a place of knowledge, pride, and truth. Uh, next slide, please. This next one is an installation honoring her great grandmothers, great aunts, mothers, and grandmothers. This is her um, maternal altars. And it is a homage to the tangible bridge to her ancestral lineage that stretches back centuries, encompassing both pain and perseverance and the reflections of this lineage of strong black women who withstood the onslaught of adversity from the brutalities of enslavement to the har harshness of Jim Crow. These altars are more than just artistic expression, according to Morozik. They are spiritual ties that binds her to these incredible women who survived and thrived against all odds. So next slide, please. Um, she also has a series that that kind of works on the uh, shows the cotton as a as, uh, very um, important symbol of oppression and, and uh, trauma in the African-American community. The Cash Crop series delves with a profound and often painful history associated with cotton, where the pinnacles of global prosperity for the United States bears with it the weighty history of forced labor, displacement, and cultural detachment of innumerable souls of African descent. As an artist, Morozik uh, considers her journey as an oscillation between local roots and global pl platforms. Currently, she is in Africa right now touring some of these weaving uh, communities um, to to further um, improve her art. So the essence of the, the work is that the essence of the Black spirit or the African-American spirit has been capitalistically exploited. And we as Black people are indeed golden. Our very essence shines with the luster of resilience, strength, and boundless beauty. That is why our culture is so fertile, growing through every tribulation looming into the influences that change the entire world. So she is reclaiming the symbolism of cotton to kind of reassess history and reclaim their role in it. Next slide, please. Althea Mary Price is a nationally renowned printmaker and um, mixed media installation artist who uses artificial and human hair in her work. She is a person who is concerned about the Black youth and the Black women historically and the risk that they are facing in the current um, situation. She is very much interested in kind of Assessing and, 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 and reflecting on the topics of the real and the false, the decoration and the imitation as exploration uh, of these uh, materials are also symbolic of the history of the African-American community that uh, she 
is wanting to to explore again the, the the issue of hair and the standards of beauty inspired by the social implication and its relationship to female identity women and culture is the cornerstone of of her work next slide please so these are like some of the helmets that she has uh made for a series for her inspired by her daughters next slide please Jernicia Onekuwalu is one of the youngest um, part participants in the show. She just received her BFA from the Middle Tennessee State University, and these are from her uh, BFA exhibition. Her desire to represent the global majority, specifically of African American and African descendants, uh, to play with these traditional women's hairstyle, fashion, and characteristics that embody power, culture, beauty, and strength are the subject of her um, work. So she was born in Murfreesboro and raised in Memphis, Tennessee, and now she is based in Nashville making these ceramic uh, works. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Another ceramicist, a more um, senior from uh, Jernicia's figurative work and to the more functional vessels of Jackie Schickler. Next slide, please. Jackie is a, a performance artist who came from music and, and stand-up comedy to the visual arts. Her husband, Mark Schickler, is the prominent um, scholar of the artist William Edmondson. Um, and, and, and Jackie has uh, felt like her years of training in the performance art and all of her experiences in the other forms of art has affected her art creation. And this is a work that displays graffito, which is a very Italian um, process of having layers in clay and paint. And, and, and then she etches them to reveal the different colors of those layered. Um, and, and, and in a way, you know, the, the, the African American culture, the various layers that that is showing and unfolding, is is kind of uh, symbolic of that. She says her life as a singer brings the presence of rhythm, tone, and harmony to her work. Her actor's life expresses emotion, drama, humor, and play. Her director's life offers perspective, guidance, and discovery. Making pots allows these creative aspect to appear as uh, utilitarian. Um, vessels uh but also in the making she appears so her vessels are representative of herself next slide please next slide please now the next one is viola spells and we are getting to our uh last uh artist in the in the group viola is an etsu alumna and she is technically living in Asheville, but since her creative practice is very much influenced by her study at ETSU in the art and design department, um, making jewelries, it's it's uh, we felt compelled to include her in the show. And the work that she does is she crochets metal wires. Those are copper wires that she creates in order to um, expose um the the different practices of her multi-generational uh family of artists who crochets and the different women who uses crochet as an art form she um symbolizes the multitude of emotion in women's life through her jewelries and each work for her tells a different stories that are representative of the connection between the woven material and the social fabric that create color and comfort in the homes families and communities of women around the world so she used to work for a library and now she is a full-time artist the chains that she is wearing is uh next slide please uh one of the works in the show although in purple because we had to um, commission her to make this specifically. These are chains that also symbolizes the chains that was used in the Middle Passage that holds the, the African bodies in place in the ships and, and, and drag them to the, the squares where they are sold as uh, formerly enslaved people. So she has reclaimed that imagery from pain and bondage 
to a form of beauty. Next slide, please. Another um, alumni from ETSU is Will Lydia Wilson. She is, um, next slide, please. She is a doll maker who also was an educator. And next slide, please. Um, similar to Viola, she also kind of started late in her in her art career. She was, um, she was, practicing a different uh, role and then went to the arts and, 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 and really use it as a spiritual practice. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, I think our, um, we are nearing the end of the, the, okay. So um, can you go back a little bit, please? Thank you. We have two more artists in that group and then we're almost done. <laughs> so, okay, now we're with Lydia Wilson. So Lydia is also um, kind of our female Sammy Nicely in Johnson City. She makes dolls. Uh, she's kind of like the hybrid of Sammy Nicely and Bessie Harvey and 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 Ludis, Ludi Amos and Andre McCoy. Again, she makes these dolls out of discarded materials she um encouraged her her students to use arts and crafts to express themselves she was a very shy introverted lady and yet her work is so complex and 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 and, and, and so beautiful and yet very fragile and yet the strength of character is 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 always represented in her work um she was a fibers uh, student or, or graduate here from the art and design and has really touched the lives of a lot of people in, in, in the community through her work. Next slide, please. The work that she had for the gallery is from the Sammy Nicely collection um, donated by the Martha Alfonso, one of her benefactors. Again, you will see here the different materials of clay and paper and wood and metal that she puts together in and 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 create nar visualized narratives in each work now the last uh, artist in the group is Nigel Woods before we go to the two uh subgroupings Nigel Woods is a artist who is also a yoga instructor and uses art as therapy she is an abstract expressionist artist dedicated to harnessing the transformative power of color psychology to nurture positive mental health, especially in the Black community. Her work transcends conventional artistic boundaries, as she said, because she endeavors to shed light on the crucial intersection of emotions and color. Her work strives to offer a unique avenue for self-discovery and healing, as well as her art becoming a conduit for meaningful discussions about mental health being. She um, has this work, which was the only, when you go to the gallery, please pull the cable and, and, and play around with, with the work. This is the only piece that you can touch in the exhibition. Um, the next set of uh, artists are actually the Black Appalachian artists, as well as the Orange Mound. Again, um, we're not going to talk a lot about them, but most of them are self-taught artists here in the Black Appalachian um, community, Johnson City, Kingsport, Bristol, uh, Elizabethan, and Jonesboro area. So we have... The first one, next slide, please, is Pam Faw. Her work is that black uh, hair. Um, she's the one with a cane. Um, she used to work for Eastman, and now that she has retired, she's focused on her her art, and now she's making these coasters and 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 images of of black women silhouettes and their hair. And uh, on the picture is also the Nikwa uh, Joiner, the one who did the, the rubber shoes. Next slide, please. This is Pamela uh, Pam Foss uh, work where she has a mirror on showing the other side of that uh, female silhouette. This was very um interactive for people and 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 really brought out a lot of conversation about how we see ourselves and how uh we define beauty 
Next slide, please. The next is uh, Donika Joyner, an LGBTQ Black woman who makes jewelries and shoes. Her mother, Donna, next slide, please, is also an artist who taught her how to, oh, sorry, this is um, Shai Perry, another alumna, um, who majored in anthropology and art here at ATSU and is now making significant contribution in the BIPOC and in diversity and inclusion uh, communities in Kansas City. She used to be an intern at the Slocum Gallery and she's now a gallery director herself. Next slide, please. The last, uh, this is Donna Olijani, Donikwa's mother, and um, she makes bags and now her daughter makes shoes. Now, next slide, please. The last group in the Appalachian, um, Black Appalachian Historical uh, Highland artists are the Story family. Magdalena Story, this work is a collaboration between Magdalena and her friend Ayla Coombs, who has passed away. Um, next slide, please. Magdalena is an 82-year-old woman who used to work at the hospital. And while there, she used to make this memory quilts where she will have like works that have the names of her co-workers or people who have visited. And it's 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 really exciting because she's not a practicing artist. She doesn't consider her health, uh, herself as an artist, but she makes crafts and beautiful crafts. The, the work on the right is a blanket that she made for her daughter, Dolores, uh, using Ankara and, and African uh, woven um, fabric. Her mother, Mattie Preston, is also a, represented in the Tipton show where we had one of her mother's, uh, Mattie Preston's work, one of Magdalena Story's uh, work, and her son's quilt uh, on the wall. Next slide, please. That really kind of shows the multi-generational uh, element and a transfer of technology and knowledge. Lastly is the Orange Mound Collective. This is, I mentioned earlier, the Memphis group, the first, one of the first historically significant communities of uh, self-purchased uh, community uh, of, of African-American communities in the country. On the left is a receptacle that says Memphis, and on the wall is the big painting uh, of a young girl whose hair is being straightened by her mom using this, you know, makeshift um, kind of uh, hair straightener from the, that is being heated in the stove, literally, um, that they used before, you know, the hair straightener uh, <laughs> technology has been developed. And... In between them is a doll by Andre McCoy. Uh, the two smaller pieces are two uh, Orange Bound Collective uh, male artists as well. Next slide, please. So there's only last two artists that I will discuss in this group. This is the collective work because, like I said, Orange Bound is such an important historical um, community. So we wanted to invite the the group to have a work in the show because I can't invite all of their members all at the same time. So I encourage them to make a collective, um, collaborative uh, fiber. And this is what they have. And it was coordinated by, next slide please, Lurlyn Franklin, a painter and uh, an art educator who's also doing her art history uh, masteral um education at University of Memphis under Dr. Ernestine Jenkins, one of the co-directors for the Crafting Blackness Initiative um, project. Next slide, please. Lastly, Luella Marshall. She is the gallery director of the Orange Mound. And the garbage receptacle is, is really interesting because a few years ago, she said there's just so much garbage in, in the Orange Mound community in Memphis that the, their, their gov local government wasn't collecting. So she organized the artists together and started this program of making these beautiful receptacles that collects garbage from the community because the local government is not doing it. And now she's partnering with local uh, organization in, in, in their community to really improve the sanitation and the garbage issues in, in, in Orange Mound and in, in Memphis 
uh, as a city in general. Luella also, I wanted to mention, was a young activist when Martin, the, the late Martin Luther King Jr. went to Memphis during the garbage sanitation uh, protest and, and, and uh, rallies. And so she was a young political activist then and now in her older years, she is still an activist for her community and using art as uh, she employs art in, in, in solving these problems and, and a continuation of her civil rights uh, movement uh, activities. The next few slides are just pictures of the artists who are in the show. Next slide, please. So these are some of the artists who attended the um, the reception last uh, and, and mostly Appalachian Highland artists. Next slide, please. And these are some of the artists who attended last uh, week's uh, panel and, and reception at Slocum Gallery. Some are common uh, faces. We had the Board of Director, uh, Board of Region Trustee Dorothy Grisham as the guest of honor that evening together with Kim Wag and Dr. Uh, Kimberly McCorkle, our provost. Next slide, please. And I think that's the end. So these are the four panelists that spoke about Black art and Black craft. Um, Bridget Jones, Bonnie Matthews, Dr. Cynthia Gadsden, and Elisheba Morosoy. Next slide, please. I think that's it. Thank you so much. And I apologize that it, we kind of used up all of our time. But thank you all for listening. And I hope you can see the exhibition and also attend the uh, crafting, uh, the... Sammy Nicely reception and panel and workshop by Andre McCoy tomorrow. Uh, I mean, Friday and Saturday at the Reese Museum. Thank you all. Thank you so much, uh, Carlotta. Please, if anyone uh, was wanting to get credit for um, the Psych Speaker Series, go ahead and send your name through uh, to me in the chat. And I know we've gone over time. Um, but if we just want to take a few minutes, if there was anyone who wanted to make, you know, any comments or ask Carlotta any questions, we could keep it open for, you know, a few more minutes. Um, please speak up. But thank you so much. That was a visually stunning presentation. Just really enjoyed it. Carlotta, well. Ms. Phyllis Hay, amazing. Thank you so much. The exhibit is is just is brilliant and your discussion of it is um I'm so glad I got to to hear this discussion. I have a quick question. Uh, um I noticed you you were talking about I love how I love the um Black South vernacular art. Um you know, I used to I I used to hear people talk about um outsider art and art brute and so I'm, I'm wondering about these different categories and what because you've talked about vessels of memory and so I love the way vernacular art brings up the language of the story that the art tells and so as a, a literature person that just I just I love that um but could you speak to that I'd love to thank you, you, Phyllis. Yes. Uh, and thank you for coming to some of the events and, and seeing the show. Your presence is always much appreciated. And yes, yeah, so, you know, when you talk about self-thought, folk art, it's always a double-edged sword. So a lot of the BIPOC artists have been packaged as authentic and, you know, uh, self-thought, like, how can they make this beautiful art despite of their uneducated uh, background and poor communities, things like that. So, you know, with the Souls Grown Deep Foundation, it's a organization in Atlanta who started collecting Black Southern artist art. And they have started kind of really inviting historians to talk about folk art and self-thought and 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 really redefining and they were the ones who uh started using the black uh south vernacular art because a lot of this artist it's a it's a it's a, it, it, it's it is a language it's a visual language the art that they do uh some of the most uh famous um artists are in alabama but we have like i said bessie harvey uh the speller couple um 
Joe Light and, and, and several Tennessee artists are in their collection. And it's, you know, a lot of them were doing yard art. They're doing like folk art, sculptures made from uh, discarded materials. And there's always the element of the spiritual. And they figured, you know, from, from the term folk art and self-thought that always has a patronizing <laughs> kind of undertone and, and, and always like a, like this big brother uh, kind of like, you know, connotation or, or it also um, kind of discriminates some of those who are academically trained, but are black creatives. So the, 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 I think I really like, I personally like the, the black uh, South vernacular uh, term because there really is a distinct uh form and 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 technique and and stylistic um process that they have developed even if they didn't know each other personally because of that common uh bondage that common economic and political uh oppression that they have suffered as a community with their forefathers you know uh as formerly enslaved uh, individuals and th these artists have really tried to kind of make sense of their world and express their the, the themselves through through the art and it, it, it is a vernacular and it is a very distinct southern uh vernacular and 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 common in the black community and of course there are southern non-black uh, community that may be similar because they also underwent a lot of economic hardships and, and, and similar political, but we can never really put into a kind of a simple term what the African-American communities have undergone and, and it's still undergoing. So I think that term is a more empowered and a more kind of self representative way of of describing their practice so um not a lot of the artists themselves are using it because it's kind of a more theoretical kind of more academic term that art historians and art curators have developed to dis describe their art but uh uh Lonnie Holly for example is the most famous of of, of this group and you know but it allows a certain discourse that is a beyond that has evolved from that kind of pre uh world war ii conversation of folk art and self-thought artists i mean there's nothing wrong with those because they are from they are folks and they are self-thought and there is respect on that but the connotations and the practice and the way they were packaged in the museums and in the in the industry was so much uh burdened by economy and, and, and capitalistic uh opportunities that I think the new term is 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 very much welcome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. That's very helpful. Very helpful. Thank you so much. I hit myself just because there was some there was some distractions and I didn't want to take away from all your wonderful comments. Um, does anyone else have any questions or comments? Before we sign off, I know where I'm headed next, straight over <laughs> to the museum. It's just beautiful. Well, okay, well, that's it. Thank you so much. I can't wait to go check it out. And yeah, this was just a wonderful, and like I said, visually stunning presentation. I didn't expect it to be so enjoying, <laughs> so enjoyable. And also we are going to have catalogs. Um, it's it's gonna have okay. a- yeah. We call the project, the Crafting Blackness Initiative, the 1619 Project for Black Craft of Tennessee. Wonderful. We really yeah. invited various Black scholars to contribute their essays. Mm -hmm. And in the next four years, 
every year we will be publishing a catalog that has some of these focus essays and the survey essays that I will be writing with my other co-authors, Dr. Ernestine Jenkins, Dr. Daryl Carter, and Bridget Jones, the art historian from the hood. Um, so she refused to go and get her PhD, but she is uh, part of the Smithsonian um, art history uh, program uh, about discussing about African-American um, historical uh, culture and, and documentation, but she prefers to be the art historian from the hood. Uh, <laughs> so, so That's awesome. Uh, yeah, so it, we will be uh, giving out some copies of this uh, catalog, but because we're poor, we cannot print as many as people sure. want, but we will be giving out a free copy in PDF format to people nice. that people can Wonderful. share. Oh, can wonderful. we also subscribe? Can we also subscribe and get a, a hard copy? Of course, of course. Okay. Yes, I Great. will reserve some for you, Phyllis, of we'll, course. Yes, and and our partners, you know, we're, we're prioritizing, of course, our, our artists, our sure. partners who have lent the collection, and you all are our partners who have uh, participated and attended some of the events. And for your students who we cannot all give a copy to, you can give out the PDF for free to whoever you want to share it with. Wonderful. Thank you so much. You're All right. Well, hey, thank you so much. Um, we will be posting video of this. So uh, hello to all our video viewers. Can't wait to uh, share it. Thank you again. It was just wonderful job. Thank you, Dr. Hale. And thank awesome. you to Karen Sullivan and Dr. Tao Huang, my boss and my co-curator for the exhibition and all the partners that I won't be able to uh, mention all. <laughs> and the artists, of course, who are in the show. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so oh, much. November 1st, Friday, Asian Adopted Adopted Journeys of Asian Women Artists. So we will be having that on the first Friday of November at Tipton Gallery. And next week, we are featuring an Asian American woman artist, fiber artist from North Carolina, John Ru Wan, with a reception and artist talk on October 10, Tuesday from 5 to 7 p.m. at Slocum Galleries. Okay. Cool. Thank you for letting awesome. me. <laughs> okay, that. great. Thank Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you so much.